Welcome to From One Screen to Another. Basically, to sum this all up, this is a webcam interview show where I sit down with very interesting people and ask them some questions. Um, with the state of the world right now, with people being stuck in their homes due to quarantine, I wanted to very much instill a message that just because you're stuck at home does not mean you can't do anything. You have a wonderful asset, which is the internet. It's a wonderful tool and you can still create, you can still meet people, you can still talk. So don't be down, be positive, and use what we have right now to our advantage. Today we are sitting down with an awesome dude named Matt Hill. For most of us, he has been basically a part of the cartoons of our childhood, uh, ranging from anything from Street Sharks to Ed, Ed and Eddie. You can also look at him in anime like Card Captor Sakura and Inuasha. So, without further ado, let's talk to Matt Hill. In about 60 seconds, uh, how would you describe yourself and who you are? Wow, that's a good question. Well, you know, a lot of people who know me uh, say that, um, you know, I'm super energetic and uh, I love life, love people, love the planet. Um, so much so I arrived at, at about uh, almost, I guess, a month and a half early when I was born, mm -hmm. a few years back. Um, but, uh, yeah, my my joining to this wonderful craft of acting, um, you know, started when I was 13. And uh, since then, um, I, gosh, I got to be part of um, some of the first cartoons that ever came to Canada. So um, Captain Nintendo, mm -hmm. you know, that's the voice of Kevin in that one. So that kind of all started it off. And since then, I've been part of the Ninja Turtles franchise. I got to play Raphael um, on a couple of occasions. Uh, being everyone's favorite bed on uh, Ed, Ed, and Eddie and... Uh, Care Bears. Um, I just finished three seasons of um, playing um, Ten Ten on Dino Trucks, um, which is on um, Netflix. And uh, f for the My Little Pony fans, I got to play Soren. So that that's kind of my career's been. I guess what thirty. I guess I'm in officially year thirty three, right now. So um, it's been a, a long, wild, amazing. Uh, right. One of the plus sides, definitely, with your career is like you got to touch a lot of cornerstones, whether it ranges from Western media to across the seas, everywhere in between, and you you've definitely gotten to do a lot of stuff over oh, the years. Yeah, man, it's like that's that's why sometimes it's like this where you know I'm I'm sort of running through some of the stuff I've been you know invited to participate in. That's the beautiful thing to say about being an actor is you never really know kind of when the next thing is gonna come around. You know, mm -hmm. so for me, yeah, getting to do everything from sort of like bona fide, um, say like, you know, classic Saturday morning cartoons um, to then, you know, Cartoon Network type things. Then going over to like, um, you know, the anime side of the world, getting hired to do voices, you know, on that genre. And, you know, it's all these sort of like different captions of, I think, in some respects, why human beings really, why we all love animation so much and, you know, or why say fans of different things love such different things as well right yeah i think that's definitely true and you know it just animation it gets to kind of go across what we're used to being normal basically anything is possible as long as someone can draw it so that's a nice thing and then you know at whether it's someone drawing to your voice or you doing the voice to someone's drawing you know the the bounds are really kind of endless with that medium Tomorrow I could be animated into a frog. <laughs> the next day I could be the prince, you know? Mm -hmm. the next, but not, then, like, you know, the prince that gets turned into a frog. <laughs> so, you know, it's, uh, or, the, you know, the original, like, Mr. Ed, you know, like, <laughs> how is that guy? Like, it's wild. Why, why did that show become so iconic? I just think it's so amazing. I feel mm -hmm. like, so grateful to have been a part of it. You are very prolific for the character of Ed. Um, there's a lot of people that love it. I went to one of the larger Facebook fan pages for Ed, Ed, and Eddie. Uh -huh. And uh, the other night, I, I just asked, like, if you had some questions, what would you like to ask? And we got, I think, 50 or so questions. Obviously, I'm going to condense it down to, like, the five that yeah. we talked about. And, you know, the ones that are very specific, I'll maybe mention a name. The rest I'll just put on the screen because some of them had very similar questions so i'm going to kind of make a little amalgam for you um but the one first question i was going to ask you timothy fontaine asked do when you're home in private do you ever kind of start talking to yourself in the voices that maybe something that you're not currently using for a show uh him specifically he asked if whenever you're angry do you ever talk like ed so <laughs> <laughs> well you could ask my girlfriend marie would say 
yes, indeed, yes, you're Bippy. I, I often, she'll be like, what are you doing? And I'll be like, oh, sorry, I was just talking like Ed to myself. And, you know, I often like, I'll just break into like an Ed um, without even realizing it, you know? And uh, um, I think partly because he is just such a unique entity in the world. Mm-hmm. Then, you know, I, I can see why that, um, well, I guess in, in, in particular, that, that show, I think, has had such a long-lasting effect on people because it arrived at a time when, you know, I don't know, it just really struck a chord, you know, and, and uh, it was just so damn original, yeah. you know, um, and I think that that's why then, say, like you, say, growing up as a kid, watching it, you know, that now as, as like, kids who were watching it then, are now bringing their kids to the table to watch it, mm-hmm. you know? Um, and so that's really neat. I, you know, and I guess when I get like really old, maybe like grandkids of the grandkids, maybe I'll, you know, like when I'm a hundred, <laughs> I'll be like, Oh, hello. Oh, and oh, I just messed myself. Oh, <laughs> you know, hopefully it doesn't get to that too, you know, <laughs> too bad. But, uh, yeah. uh, but you know, like you say, it's, uh, out of probably the, you know, the, the dozens of shows I got to be a part of, I, I think definitely Edit Netty for sure is probably, you know, I think one of the most loved in terms of sort of like everyone around the world. Mm-hmm. Uh, so it feels really, like I feel really honored to be part of that family, I guess, right? Yeah, I mean, one of the nice things, and obviously this is based off just of my interpretation, but with Edit Netty, yeah. When it came out, like you said, it was that right time, and it was really happening where everyone was very much cul-de-sac kids, and that yeah. show had such a wide variety of people in it and characters that yeah. everyone felt like they were kind of represented to one degree or another. It's like, oh, I relate to this person, or oh, I relate to that person. Absolutely. Oh, yeah. I mean, it's uh, and that was the brilliance of working, say, with Danny Antonucci, who's the creator mm-hmm. of it, right? Who, I mean, he had, this is the wild thing. He had the whole entire show inside his head. I mean, he had obviously lots of notes and storyboards and things like that. But when he wanted a character to say a certain thing in a certain way, he wouldn't let the tape go till he'd heard what it was that he was, you know. And so I would get caught in like, I, I wouldn't be laughing the right way. And he'd be like, no, you got to do it like, you know, like this. So I'd be going like, oh, <laughs> you know, like this. You know, and you, then finally, like, out of sheer desperation, you know, you say it correctly, and then they're like, all right, okay, good, all right, you got it, good, you know, and you're like, okay, okay, you know, sweating your, <laughs> you're sweating your brains out because, you know, you, you've been trying to get this line right. Mm-hmm. But it's the only show I've ever done where we never had pickups to do, which is unheard of in animation. Usually the show runs long or, you know, the scenes get rewritten because when they go to animate it, it kind of doesn't work. But, I mean, that's, again, Danny Antonucci and the team at, you know, AKA, um, my God, they were dialed in. You know, they they knew these characters and sort of which way they were sort of living in the world. And so, you know, um, it, it truly is one of the originals in terms of, like, never having to do pickups. That definitely and, sounds like he was a good communicator with what he oh, wanted to and, do. And I really, you know, I, I gotta hand it to them because they really knew what they wanted and, you know, in many respects, sometimes it was frustrating in the moment because you, because as an actor, you always want to do what the director wants of you. Mm-hmm. And sometimes, I, you know, we could see it in this case in, say, Danny's, you know, um, going like, ah, oh, they're just not getting it. And then the second we got it, he'd be like, yes, okay. Ah, <sighs> got it move on you know we're just like (laughs) what do we do (laughs) you know (laughs) so um but it's something that taught me so much how to sort of like learn to act on the fly and how to you know like boldly go for a line even when you have no idea how it may turn out you know Speaking of Danny, uh, I'm going to make some references to um, some videos because, like I said, I've been doing some, just after you agreed, because you were the first guy I asked, and I already had a playlist of interviews that I was already watching, just in case you did. Show all those bloopers, man. (laughs) Yeah, but uh, so uh, basically at the end of this video, I have a playlist that uh, it links to a bunch of other interviews you did, where if someone, say we didn't talk about something and someone wants to know, like 
there's a full list. Um, one of the ones that I really enjoyed watching, and I actually just finished it uh, a second time before we got on, was a documentary about the uh, Misadventures game. Okay. That you guys recorded, and it, more what I really loved is because hearing all you guys talk about like the process, the higher energy of it, um, and you know with Danny's direction, uh, he mentioned something where very much at first you guys were trying to do the voice of the characters he kind of had in mind, and I'm paraphrasing of course. But by the time the show was over, and you know you guys got to the game and all these other parts, you guys very much became the voices of these characters. Like you turned into these people. Um, yeah. In the group, the one biggest question I saw, and again I'll list all the names of people who asked it, were very much around the voice that you chose. How did you pick the voice of Ed, and how did that kind of evolve over the duration of the show? Because like you said, or like Danny mentioned, how at first you guys were doing the voices that he wanted, but very much it became very innate to you and natural. So what was that? Oh, absolutely. Such a good question because, you know, it was no different even getting to be able to be chosen to be the voice that we were, you know, auditioning for. You know, another first in Vancouver back in the day, um, I think we probably officially had like eight callbacks for this thing, you know, which usually in animation, you know, maybe get like maybe three callbacks would be kind of like, oh, okay, you know, they really were taking their time to find people. But same thing, Danny had such a vision of what he wanted the cast to sound like and be like. And so, you know, I often share the, like, kind of the moment when out of absolute sheer desperation, they finally had the three Eds in the studio at the same time. So me and Tony and Sam, who they, I guess, were kind of whittling it down to going, okay, I think that these guys might be the, you know, they might be the Eds. But they still ran us through our paces. And, and at one point, out of sheer desperation, because I, like, I literally had no idea what they wanted um, or what Danny wanted, and, I, and, I, and I've never done it again, but I literally I tapped and I blew into the mic which I then automatically saw that, you know, the engineer go like, what? Like, don't blow, you know, you don't blow in the mic. But I, I mean, I didn't blow into it to, to break it, mm -hmm. but I just, I, I remember blowing into it and I tapped on the mic and then I went, oh, oh, uh, how do you get water from this thing here? And literally I saw Danny go, what, what the hell was that? And I thought, oh, shit, I'm done. I'm going to get thrown out. I'm going to, I'm never going to get another job ever again. And what he actually heard was that was the essence of Ed. So literally there's, and you got to remember it's quiet on the other side of the glass, mm -hmm. right? We couldn't hear them. We just, I just saw this animated creature jumping to the, to the studio console to make sure the engineer didn't catch what I just said. Right. And again, I, I was thinking, Oh God, I'm going to get fired before I even get hired. <laughs> then Danny said, do that and keep doing that. And you've got the voice of Ed. And that was it. And I remember, like, I was so confused going, like, I, all I keep saying is, how do you get water from this thing here? <laughs> right? But mm -hmm. what it did was it allowed every time I would say, get out of Ed, especially for the first, say, like, you know, 13 episodes, because so much was also riding on everything, right? He would often then they'd go, like, ah, oh, play the thing, play the thing, play the thing. Right? So then they would play me the, you know, how do you get water from this thing here? And so then I would get the cadence of, or the essence of Ed. Just like, you know, Sam has his own version of, you know, how did he get double D? What was that moment for him, right? You know, I bet you his tagline ultimately is probably like, oh, messy, 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 messy. You know, and then, you know, Tony's probably like, ah, you know, how the hell am I going to sell you something or whatever, right? So. Mm -hmm. You know, the, the, especially the three Eds, because they were so specific. Well, I mean, all the characters were. Oh my God! Like, you know, everybody on this show was like, you know, it was it was it was so geniusly thought out and and written out that I mean, you know, like I say, it's an honor to have been a part of it for sure. So you know, and like I say, this this run that I'll talk about maybe if we do have time later that I did around North America. One of the main things was, was, you know, speaking to kids in schools. Mm -hmm. So, you know, you got to remember 2009 was the economic meltdown in North America, right? Or 2008, 2009. And we literally just finished running across Canada. 
and we entered America as America was for sale in foreclosure in the you know the worst you know almost depression like scenario say economic wise so to be able to go in and be able to say to a school of like 1500 kids you know hey who wants to save the planet with M and stuff and that and you you'd have 1500 kids just losing their brains into happiness Mm -hmm. right and teachers going like oh my god my kids love that show you know and so it was another sort of cap in the feather of being able to to say that our life like our work actually means something yeah i mean it definitely sounds like you had it with the opportunities that you got provided for your skill and the work that you did you were smart enough to try to amplify take that opportunity that you had and amplify it into a good direction uh when it comes to your running we'll jump ahead to that right now where um i'm gonna look again over at my notes but uh, I, i think i have the gist of it where I honestly, I did not know about this until I watched your TEDx talk last week, where with voice actors very much, we we know the voices. Sometimes we know a little fun facts, but we don't know the person. We don't know, you know, you that well. And I, I just found it so fascinating listening to you talk about your love for running, how it kind of started when you were a kid and how it amplified. You are the founder of On The Run Vancouver. Uh, you've done the uh iron man canada are you are you past eight times this at this point or how many have you done yes now i'm on nine um and um if it gets reinstated before because of obviously the coronavirus right Mm. now um the current one that i'm scheduled to do which would be number 10 um is right now on hold um just obviously until you know the planet's going to be deemed a safe place to be in Mm. you know sort of together and swimming if i can run it um but no, the actual run around um, North America was called Run for One Planet, mm-hmm. uh, which then on the run was a coaching program that I did afterwards. Um, but yeah, the actual, say, tour, Run for One Planet, where you were saying I got to bring my love of running people and the planet together, it was such an added bonus when I finally realized it that I let the cartoon voices come into the presentations as well. You know how sometimes things, something's so obvious? But you don't actually see it mm-hmm. because you go like, oh no 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 no, I don't I don't want to you know I don't want to hoodwink kids. I want to go in and talk to them about making healthy choices for themselves and the planet. But then I realized, and it was the kids who taught us that when we were actually bombing, doing some of the school events when we first got out on the road, because they were getting kind of bored. After we kind of just, you know, said, hey, we ran here from, you know, somewhere, like we ran here, then we ran there. But then it was literally out of desperation. My tour partner goes, hey, hey, kids, do you know I get to run with a Ninja Turtle every day? Right. And, you know, all of a sudden, you know, one kid's like, what? Who is it? Who do you get to run with? And then I knew that was my moment to go, you know, hey, 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 yo, 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 who wants to save the planet with rap and stuff and, you know, Matt and blah, blah, blah. And then that literally turned them from being too cool for school to then we were like their instant rock stars because we had, I mean, we'd sort of bridged that gap of our world into their world via these crazy cartoon characters. And I think serendipitously, and thank God, were really popular also in that moment in time. But it wasn't until I actually embraced that as a way to be able to to share the message even um, even more fun. Then everything just took off, and it was I mean it was amazing. It was quite a ride. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it's definitely a testament to the fact that one one idea that I try to tell people because you know whether it's from your hobbies to your you know your work, your passions, everything in between, we're not just one thing. And I it really sounds like you found a great way to combine a bunch of aspects of yourself into one thing, one direction. Absolutely. Um, when it comes to running, uh, one thing that, and excuse me if I get any of the facts wrong, because I was not familiar with the story of Terry Fox before your TED Talk. And then I started watching some documentaries on him and going through that process. It, you, he's, you mentioned he was a pretty much a big impact on your your passion for running, but also involved with, uh, I believe, one of your first runs uh, for One Planet? Yeah, well, Terry, yeah, so Terry Fox, he was a guy back in, like, in the, in the 80s that, so I was 10 at the time, and I guess when he was 18, was diagnosed with um, cancer in his leg, 
And so at that time, you pretty much instantly had to get that leg removed. You know, he was just out of high school, right? So he was just a kid himself. But his journey, you know, he said, you know what? I'm never going to be a quitter. I, I need to do something that's going to also give back because he saw so much suffering of kids even younger than him um, when he was getting, you know, when he was healing. And so he decided by the time he was, you know, um, out and healthy um, to run across Canada, which, you know, back then, nobody, I think people are thinking like, what? You're going to run across Canada and you actually only have one leg? You know, as a 10-year-old, we always kind of want to be like our heroes. And I remember saying to my dad, you know, one day I'd like to do something like Terry, not even knowing that it was going to take another 30 years and then, you know, going down the road of being an actor for, for a while first to then kind of have a full circle moment to then go, oh, maybe it's about also running and taking these superhero voices that I've been gifted to play and my love of running and people and then the planet to then, you know, somehow convince, connive <laughs> my, my friend Steph at the time to, to go, hey, I'll, I'll come and do this with you too. <laughs> I, I think, I often wonder, like, who who would be your guy's childhood hero in America? Yeah, I mean, uh, it can range, really, I mean, obviously, you know, with Canada being large, too, there's so many different regions of each of our countries where it really depends on where you're at. Uh, me, personally, I grew up jumping between all the states. I was a military brat growing up. Yep. So, um, it really... I think for my generation, you either fell into the category of there. You had your sports heroes. You had your, you know, some of us also, you know, specifically towards you know people like you who we watched in cartoons. Like we're like, oh man, we use creative content as our kind of idea for like, oh man, I want to be like so and so. I want to be like this character I saw on TV or screen. Absolutely, yeah. Yeah. So I think it definitely jumps around, and you know, I'm sure we have someone who's probably similar. I just know that, you know, his Terry Fox's story sounds just so unique that I couldn't pinpoint someone who, at least on our end, that sounds just yeah. like him. Yeah. Well, you know, it's wild too that I really believe that it's like, you know, sometimes a generation somebody comes along that you know, like that. In this case, say Terry Fox comes along, you know to then be able to sort of picture his way of con, con, sorry, contributing, contrib contributing, contributing, <laughs> um, is to go from one side of it to the other, all so that it shows himself as well that, hey, he still has a huge life to live here, right? Mm -hmm. And it's also in service of something. That, to me, is the big takeaway always, is that I think we're always asking ourselves, what lights us up first as human beings being here on this planet and by that lighting us up how can we then rock and roll in the world and then light up others in the world being us in the world right because for everyone mm -hmm. it's different right for some it's it's becoming the best you know band in the world for some it's being the best drawer for some people it's you know being an olympian for some people it's you know doing like rock star like interviews like you're doing right mm -hmm. it's it's all different for all of us, but I feel like our commonality is we all are on this planet for a certain amount of time. So why not try as best we can to all contribute in a good way so that at the end of it, it all adds up to a whole lot of awesome. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Definitely. So, yeah, you know, and, and I, you know, I, I just really hope that as the coronavirus rolls through that, you know, it really helps us to be able to keep all these basic values that we're all remembering, I think, a lot, again, too, by having to stay home, mm -hmm. by having to connect with people in a different way. I believe that it's going to help us also, I think, you know, kind of rewrite our rewrite our story, rewrite our history, you know? I hope. I think so. Well, I mean, very much, you know, in the vein, like how you have this high positive energy to you. I think, obviously, there's a lot of, unfortunate things happening during the circumstances but just trying to find a little bit of that silver lining of opportunity whether you're a parent now getting more time for a child or you're a creative person getting more opportunities to do something like how i mentioned to you the whole reason i'm doing this is because i like the idea of the message that though we are stuck in our homes 
we have the internet, which is a tool that you know not many people had in the past when circumstances like this happen. So, yeah, and basically there is so many opportunities still on the table, and I feel like people can psych themselves out, unfortunately, and kind of forget about what tools they have, whether it's in their pocket, at their computer desk, you know, whether it's communicating with people across the world or seizing opportunities where, you know, we don't know each other, but I took the shot where I'm like, you know, I, I saw your website, I found your email, like maybe he'll say yes. And I feel like a lot of people need to take those chances for these opportunities. Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. You nailed it, man. It's because it is, it's by taking those opportunities to just see. Because, like, you just, that was brilliant. Because sometimes, the answer will be yes. A lot of the time, the answer will be yes. Or if it's a no, it's only because it's something is going to support you with something even better. You know, like it's uh, you know, because even on say my journey being an actor with the same through line of say being a runner and a and a guy who just cares about the you know the planet and doing it the way I'm doing it. I've had so many falls. I've I've had so many quote unquote sort of failures. So many times I've reached out higher and bigger than I've ever thought I could ever do, and it's fallen apart before my my very eyes. We had so many no's for Run for One Planet, but then they eventually led to yeses. Then they eventually then it leads to oh my God, this is amazing! How can I get involved? To then you know same thing say with acting, right? It's like everything everything I I believe obviously has a season, a reason, a you know a meaning. A, you know, um, so even a great failure, often there's a great gift on the other side, and it's our job to basically either just sit still long enough to figure out what the gift is, or allow that to roll in and be almost like our master's degree in whatever path we're on. Right. Yeah, I mean, it's you know very much in the mindset. Uh, you mentioned how you started acting around 13. I believe uh, didn't you have a story where you you skip school, I think, and you went to a an office of a talent agent or something along those lines. Where if you never did that, if you never yeah. took that jump, tried to seize that opportunity, Absolutely. you wouldn't be where you're at. I completely agree. Yeah, you know, because on that certain day, you know, why did I think my life was half over thirteen? I don't know, <laughs> but oh my god, I'm glad that I did because mm -hmm. you know, like, because it really was there. I know that because I know myself, right? It's like. It was that desire going, okay, dude, if you're really going to make this happen, like it has to happen today, you know? And, and so, yeah, you know, I think I did my best, you know, Oscar worthy performance that day, convincing my parents I was too sick to go to school because I convinced them, mm -hmm. <laughs> and, you know, got the agent that day and then got grounded later that night because, you know, my agent said, hey, we'd love to take them. <laughs> my dad's like, what? <laughs> I thought you were sick. <laughs> so, you know. Um, but yeah, you, I mean, it's 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 like everything, like even Run For One Planet, because I got what I call my sort of big download from like being at 28,000 feet on an airplane and how serendipitously that I was actually heading to an animation convention to meet fans that liked the work that I got to do. So it, it, it was all these serendipities colliding, but also to in answer to the questions I've been asking since then go backwards to when I watched Terry Fox going across Canada 20 years earlier. Do you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. So that all these things and all these steps that we're taking, they all have purpose and meaning. And sometimes they make no sense, but then all of a sudden they all collide at, in this case, say 28,000 feet and go, you know, you're going to run, you're going to run a long way. You know, it's going to be for something that you've deeply wanted to do is your contribution getting to, you know, be Matt Hill in the world. Right? And, and so all the other gifts, because I just asked and I shared, you know, because a big, a big one for me has always been not asking for help to, to sort of be the quote unquote guy in the group that like just does it all. But I realized quite quickly, you know, and thank God I've had so many amazing gifts as, as, as people in my life that have often been that kind, you know, sometimes like even like, what I perceive as not kind, but it's but it's actually it's the most kind of kind. It's like tough kindness, where they go, dude. If you want this to happen, you have to ask for help, because you can't always do everything yourself, right? And so, you know, in my moment of sometimes getting over my fear of asking people, 
for something, it, it's it's changed my life because you know, like I said, there's there's now you have to ask people for help, right? Or you have to ask, and it doesn't dis it doesn't disown you from the, your own part of the work that you have to do. You know? Oh, definitely. Um, while we're still talking about running, I figured I'd check. I know you mentioned how your sites getting updated and all that. Have you hit 300 runs yet uh, for marathons? I know that was your goal. <laughs> oh, yes. I've actually, yes. I need to update that website. Yes, I have. Yes. Well, yes. congratulations nice. there. Well, well, thank you. Thank you very much. Yeah. No, I'm, yeah, I'm being proud, oh, man. That's a good question. I have no idea what I'm at now because I, I just, I've... I pretty much just run and walk and speed walk everywhere that I need to go, right? So, mm -hmm. um, yeah, but I'm definitely over that part. I think it still is a great message that applies to people that are fans of you that are still older. Like, you know, my age, you know, when I started doing an office job, you gain a little bit of weight and stuff like that. Having, like, seeing someone like you with the energy that you have, trying to encourage people to still go for that run and things like that, it really makes me one day want to try to do a marathon myself. But I don't know if I'll get there, but, you know, you know it's always possible. You know, you keep me posted on that run, buddy. <laughs> Absolutely. It'll take, it'll take a little bit of uh, getting ready for it, practicing, and, you know, getting all that good stuff out of the way. But you know what? That, but that's the truth of it. It's like, it's it, it does it whatever anybody's marathon is, that's the thing. True. It's being able to just be able to, like, as cheesy as it sometimes sounds, it really is sometimes that simple where you go, okay, just keep putting one foot in front of the other. When you gotta get up a hill and you think you might not be able to get up that hill, well, take a rest for a second, then get up and take another step. You know what I mean? It, Definitely. It's like, you know, I think that is the ultimate truth, obviously, in this in this life, right? It's like, you know, it's like we're all on an ultra marathon through life. It's it, it's you know, even if you're not a runner, it's just you know, we we're all on this you know this human in motion journey. That you know, interestingly enough, even say with this big slowdown with the coronavirus, I think it's really wild that we're being forced, even because let's say flights can't fly right now, and we can't just like run to the store right now because they're asking us to sort of go slow and you know not go different places as you know as much as we're used to going. I think as a as a species of of people, if we're giving ourselves a great gift to like you said earlier, be able to connect in, in a different but as most even more powerful way, right? Mm -hmm. Because right now it is connecting and it is showing us that this is actually possible to do it this way. I mean, the nice thing about your message, and whether it's from when you first started writing about your idea on an airplane to now, is it's a timeless message that's powerful and it's important. Anything from the basic level where you're telling kids that they matter to how their value in themselves and how they matter can affect everything around them. Absolutely. And, and you know, and I think that that's, that's probably one of the core messages as well is being able to, to ask a kid and a big kid at heart. So like, say someone like you um, or their teachers, or their parents to say like, you know, what's possible for you today? Right. Because that then gets us into that conversation of going like, Oh, Holy moly, there is something possible for me today. What is that? Mm -hmm. Right? And for each, for everybody, it's going to be different, right? Definitely. Um, so, you know, that's what I like. I think that's, you know, that's what gets me excited. This might be one of those things where every generation, to some extent, could say this about themselves. But, yeah. you know, with, we'll, we'll use Ed, Ed and Eddie as a time frame example. I believe that show went from 99 till 08 in running time. Um, yeah. That time period from the mid 90s to the late 2000s, it was a very a unique place for cartoons on TV. But specifically, Cartoon Network had this big moment in that time period. Um, what was it like working on a show for that network? Um, what was it like working at that time in cartoons, say, versus today? It seemed like a, it was a more energy based, at least from the outside perspective. So, um, sorry, when you say energy-based, meaning, like, a lot more energy behind the whole, like, um, like, massiveness of it, you mean? Uh, that, as well as, I mean, to the extent that everyone seemed very 
intensely invested obviously people are still passionate about their projects but yes. everyone it, it was a, it was a moment of pure creativity where everyone was just trying to do everything they could at that moment yeah that's you know that's a good point because you know i guess the only thing i think i can speak to that um is what it felt like say being say on the actor's side of it because all I ever remember, because I didn't ever read, because I'm so computer not literate, mm -hmm. so I'm not a gearhead already, so I didn't, I never played video games, I never sort of um, went and read like um, uh, fan pages and things like that, so I didn't actually know how popular Ed, Ed and Eddie in this case was. It didn't really hit till, like I said, when we, when I went out on my own adventure, say with Run For One Planet, when I actually truly had the aha moment of, oh my God, this particular show really has hit and made a difference in so many people's lives, right? And even there, I only had the slice of, you know, I mean, we did the perimeter of America and Canada, so only had, you know, say like, in that respect, 11,000 miles and then the 220 schools that we went to. So even that was just a small slice of the insanity of, of how amazingly received Ed Ed Nettie was, right? Mm -hmm. It was the enthusiasm that, like, literally, you know, you could go, like, you know, like that. Who wants to save the planet with, you know, with Ed and Steph and Matt, and, right? And, you know, you'd have, like, 3,000 kids in a school lose their shit in B, like, yes, we'll do anything! Just keep talking like that. <laughs> you know? um, and, and that was, you know, like I say, a, a, a small window into, I think, I think this energy that you were talking about in terms of, say, like creativity and, you know, and all that sorts of stuff, right? It's, um, yeah, it's, you know, I don't know, maybe, maybe it's like when cartoons, you know, like, I don't know, like when records, you know, went from being on vinyl, <laughs> mm -hmm. you know, to CDs. I mean, this is a bad, bad, um, comparison but but like when sometimes they call certain things like the golden age of something and possibly because for some reason all that way of drawing and all that way and all those people creating the way that they were not just on ed ed and eddie but like you're saying if i'm hearing you correctly it's kind of like the whole energy around that time period um you know and let's say it came off of sort of you know these these networks that had these shows you know yeah, I, I think, you know, sometimes a whole collusion of energy collides and look what happens, right? Well, I mean, it's it's one of those mindsets where you know people say positive energy creates positive positive energy or creativity creates creativity. It just keeps fulfilling itself, and it just at that time it seemed like there was such a range in the style of content, whether it's animation style to the subject matter, and it's like there was a show for pretty much every single individual person of different mindsets, different backgrounds, and it was just very interesting for children's networks at the time where they were yeah. trying anything they could and just see what worked, see what happened. And it was very experimental, it felt like. Yeah. I mean, yeah. th there's uh, such a range of like, in our conversation of serendipity between topics and ideas where, you know, whether it's, you know, you seizing these opportunities to, you know, the people that you admired, whether it's seizing an opportunity to talk to them or think about the opportunities that they seized, and we're all somebody's fan to an extent. Like how you mentioned with Ed and Eddie, you didn't realize how big it was at the time. You are kind of pursuing it from an actor's mentality. You know, the people that you admired at that time, that's because when you were younger and you were the age of the people that were following the show, Ed and Eddie, you were listening to certain musicians. So it's always just kind of this completely secular process. And, you know, then it turns back around to these, say, the musicians that you admire, their kids being into you. So it gives you that connective tissue to hopefully connect with these people that you admire. So it's, it's a very interesting process how it comes down to people admiring, whether it's content, the individual, etc. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Oh, definitely. Um, it's, uh, yeah, it was at a, at a Comic-Con a couple of years ago, and it was wild because... Like, all, my whole childhood was, like, in front of me in the form of, like, Blue Ferrigno, who was the Hulk. Was the Hulk. Mm -hmm. um, Morgan Fairchild, who I just thought was the bomb when I was 12. 
Um, and then, um, and who else? The guy from, um, uh, oh, I can't remember the show, but it was a, it was a big show in the fifties. Um, but then, inadvertently, I then got introduced to them just because of obviously we're all kind of there with each other. And then like that, they found out I was like Ed on Ed and Nettie, and same thing. They're all like, dude, our kid, like my kid loves them. My other kid loves them too. So before you know it, you're having pictures with these guys who are adults, but because like you just said, their kids love the show, right? Or love some of the other stuff they got to do, right? Mm -hmm. um, it's, it's amazing, you know, and I'm, <laughs> I'm in this picture school like, oh my God, this is crazy. The Hulk's got his arm around me. Like, this is nuts, <laughs> <laughs> you know? <laughs> what are you working on right now? What's going on in your world? Because you're acting, you're doing fitness and running. You're also, I've heard you talk about doing writing in the past. What, what's going on in your world? Yeah. Well, right now I'm I'm uh, I'm, deb I'm writing. Um, I'm in the process of uh, writing a couple books right now. One um, is a is a kids or youth specific book, um, which on this next mission of Run for One Planet, um, I'll be I'll be using as a as basically like a, a leave them gift for having me be you know to come there. Mm -hmm. um, and then. Um, and then another one is uh, basically kind of like the story of a turtle's life. So basically, my more a little bit more in depth my story um, of things. Um, and then as I train and get ready to actually um, at this writing, um, I'm just waiting obviously for this virus to be done so that we can actually go outside again and you know all gather in public places together. Um, and then quite literally maybe doing another run for one planet where I'll, you know, this time it'll take a little bit longer cause I'm quite a bit slower, but, um, I'll, uh, I'll, I'll circumnavigate North America once again and, uh, you know, in a way reconnect and recommit and, you know, re-inspire hopefully, you know, a, a, another generation of kids that, you know, um, you know, possibly I feel in my heart is an even more important group of kids to reach in the, at this point particular moment you know in our planet's journey because you know i just think there's there's so many things pressing on kids you know not feeling like they matter or not feeling like holy crap am i even going to have a planet to to be a, you know to be able to thrive on mm -hmm. right you know and i'm kind of in that unique age where you know i'm not a kid anymore and at the same time i deeply and, and deeply see um, through my own journey with, say, my own children and the children that are in my life, that they're really, like, they're so dialed in and they're so smart. And they're, and not like we weren't smart back then, but I think kids are even more connected now mm -hmm. because of this thing called technology that I think in some respects, you know, you look at all the genius of technologies that have been created, let's say in the last, you know, say like even like 50 years or 60 years, but now I think this generation is going to have to figure out how do we sustain ourselves as a, as a planet by using all these technologies. Because right now, there's a lot of, unfortunately, I think there's a lot of negative aspects of a lot of this easy technology that in some respects helps, you know, it's kind of helped create a, a throwaway society. You know, it's like when I hear facts like there's going to be more pieces of, of plastic in the ocean than actual fish by night by you know 20, 2050 you know that makes me go okay well i have to say something to that i really choose to say use my however many you know candles i've got left burning on my say my life i want to know that okay i tried to do the best i could to leave a better impact on people and especially kids right that's i don't know they're my wheelhouse i think mostly most of the time, I think, because they're taller than me by the time they're in the fifth grade anyhow. So <laughs> it's, you know, it's like I just think like we need to be able to be a voice of a positiveness for them, right? Mm -hmm. um, so it doesn't mean I have all the answers. It doesn't mean I'm going to, you know what I mean? Like I'm, I'm just as human as, as the next guy, like you as well. I just feel like for me, this really is my, my moment to also then say, okay, well, okay, we went around once before. Well, What's wrong with going around again and, and saying, hey, guys, guess what? I was here 10 years ago. I'm back. <laughs> Let's have a chat. You know what I mean? And, and it's because it's taking up a new conversation 
of like I think in a way with a new generation of kids that are so passionate to be in this conversation. Thank you everyone so much for checking out the first episode of From One Screen to Another. And thank you, Matt Hill, for being my first guest. This was amazing. If you want to keep tabs on anything Matt Hill is currently doing, check out his website, matt-hill.com. You can also check him out on YouTube and Twitter at Matt Hill Inspire. If you'd like a custom video sent to you from Matt Hill, you can check him out on Cameo.com. And that's at Cameo.com slash I'm Ed. Also, keep in tabs on his Run for One Planet initiative. You can find that out at runforoneplanet.org. And also, everything me and him talked about, there is a playlist included at the end of this video. So if you want more Matt Hill in your life, check those out. And if you want to follow me, you can find me at Larry D. Lane pretty much on all social media platforms. Thanks again, guys and I will see you next time. Oh, wait. Also, uh, yeah, uh, this was supposed to be over by now, but definitely let me know who else you want to see. Comment below. Subscribe. All that good stuff. It will help me keep doing this. All right. Thanks, guys. Bye.